So I have this catchphrase that I like to throw out uh, once in a while as kind of a little bit of a joke, and that is uh, acid is for amateurs. Uh, acid, of course, meaning, uh, you know, LSD, the psychedelic substance. And, um, you know, I've got a little bit of a bias. You know, I'm coming from a background, as many of you know, from uh, years of addiction. Uh, I've been in recovery since uh, 2007. But I've kind of looked at psychedelic therapy with a little bit of skepticism, uh, with a little bit of bias uh, in the sense that, you know, I kind of feel like, hey, we can do all of these things. We can have these experiences uh, and profound experiences using, you know, mindfulness and meditation and, you know, just turning ourselves inward into the, the vast universe of our minds. So although I've, you know, had experiences with psychedelics in the past, um, and I know that they can be powerful. Uh, nonetheless, I was kind of leaning, have been leaning for you know several years in the direction of you know, hey, maybe that's those things are great, but you know we can do the, all this stuff on our own. And then I met my friend uh, Owen Fitzpatrick, who is a plant medicine guide, and he facilitates using uh, the plant medicine psilocybin, uh, magic mushrooms, to help people to kind of go on an inner journey to uh, discover. Uh, you know, new things about themselves, uh, work out problems, navigate transitions, uh, all these sorts of wonderful things. So I, uh, you know, went into this conversation with an open mind, and I'm really glad that I did because I learned a lot about um, psilocybin therapy, psychedelic therapy. Um, I learned a lot about uh, Owen's process, uh, how he takes people through a journey, and it's in a very intentional way um, and with a lot of support and uh, with a lot of uh, follow-up and, um, you know, uh, feedback that happens even after the experience. So I'm really excited about this, uh, this first, um, I guess you'd call it podcast episode. Um, I haven't really decided what the name of this is going to be or, or where this is going to go. Um, so things are a little bit rough. They're a little bit choppy. Um, but we had a really great conversation, myself and Owen Fitzpatrick, where we talk about psilocybin therapy, how it intersects with complements and maybe even sometimes diverges from hypnosis and hypnotherapy. So uh, buckle your seats, uh, get ready for a very exciting, interesting conversation. I hope you enjoy it. It's so glad to, I'm so glad to be doing this with you. I've been thinking about it for a while, uh, having this kind of discussion about the, the, the differences and similarities and overlaps and uniqueness of these two different modalities, um, you know, hypnosis, NLP, these sort of these very mind-based, mindfulness kind of based strategies and techniques for healing and change and growth. And then, you know, the, the plant medicine uh, part of the, the human experience, you know, which is uh, something that's ancient, right? Something that we've also been doing for ourselves for, for millennia. Um, but this kind of just kind of have a conversation about it, you know, it's like, I, th I think it's just fascinating. I think that there's a lot of similarities, to be honest, between the two experiences and the two intended outcomes, and just about everything in between. But also there's obvious differences as well in, in terms of, you know, how they're applied and when and what kinds of outcomes are going to come about, how things are integrated and things like that. So I just, again, wanted to just say I'm super excited to have this conversation with you. And um, Owen, if you wouldn't mind just maybe introducing yourself, telling uh, me a little bit about you, who you are, where you're at, and what's going on. Certainly. Um, yeah, my name is Owen Fitzpatrick. I founded the Heart Center with my wife back in 2019, which is a yoga studio and sort of healing art space in Southwest Seattle. And uh, we're fortunate enough to have Chris as one of our um, main uh, practitioners in our in our, one of our therapy rooms. So that's how Chris and I have come to know each other. And we've done some uh, led some men's work together, which was really wonderful experience. And, you know, just had lots of sort of conversations in passing about uh, yeah, healing work, um, working with clients you know, running your own business, um, relationships, life, past lives, all that, all that wonderful stuff. So, yeah. um, yeah, super, uh, excited to just dive in and, um, more formal manner, I guess. Uh, wonderful. so yeah, so I've been doing psilocybin therapy for about 
four years now, which still feels pretty new as it's definitely a part of my life work, I think. Mm -hmm. Right. Um, and I started, I started out um, much more informally with uh, like just friends and family um, back, back when like the Michael Pollan book, how to change your mind just came out and there was a lot of buzz around it. Um, okay. There was a sort of undeniable resurgence of interest in psychedelic medicine and therapy. Right. And it just kind of struck me that like, oh, this is definitely going to be a thing. This, this doesn't seem to be going anywhere. There's like a ton of, um, yeah, media coverage and like, you know, a lot of research happening in institutions. And I personally come from a background of, um, some microfiles in my family. So my, I've like learned how to forage back in high school and uh, my parents got me into that. And then I went off to college and started experimenting with the other types of mushrooms and just had okay. some very uh, life changing experiences. Um, so I had a deep appreciation and love for mushrooms uh, for, for a while back. And then when the hype began a few years ago, uh, for for psychedelic research and and therapy it just kind of dawned on me that somebody's gonna have the job of administering this medicine to people right and i i really felt this sense of like a calling that i had honestly never really experienced before you know just like something coming in and being like you need to do that Right, uh, exactly, exactly. And not having a map for it, being like, I don't know what that means, what that's going to look like, but uh, okay, let's give it a shot. So, yeah, uh, yeah. you know, it definitely I think that's a, a yeah, I think that's a key key piece that you're kind of bringing up there that, you know, all this interest around, you know, uh, psychedelic therapies and microdosing and things like that and how these things can be used in really profound, powerful ways. And, you know, how is that, how does that look? What does that look like? And we really are, it seems like, right, we're in the infancy of that, mm -hmm. but at the same time, as a species, as a human, our human heritage of of that it goes back a long time, right? And so, so we kind of do have a map for that that we're rediscovering, maybe um, yeah. rediscovering how to do that because there's always been um, before it was kind of criminalized and poo pooed and you know, uh, suppressed and all that kind of stuff. There were, there were, there were contexts and containers for it, uh, especially in, you know, traditional cultures where that was part of their ceremony, right? That was part of their, their, their pact, if you will, with the, with the earth and with the universe, their connection with it had strong connection to that, those, those, those medicines. And there was a guide, there was somebody there to help. <laughs> there was somebody there to take someone like a newbie or even not so much a newbie is just to you know, guide each other through these experiences. So, so yeah, so it's very cool. So how much, how much of that, how much of the history of that, that sort of that, you know, the, uh, what is it? The Carlos Castaneda stories about uh, the teachings of Don Juan, which I know there's some controversy about the validity of those or the truth of, of those, but, but that kind of a mythos and, and history, how does how much has that informed you in terms of how you go about doing this with people? Hmm. Yeah, let's see. Um, yeah, it's something that I have really sought out is the you know indigenous wisdom out hmm. there. Um, you know, specifically for psilocybin, which is you know my main like area of, of focus. Um, but also for other plant medicines, just the ritual around it, um, how that plays into the whole experience. And it's interesting, like there's not much evidence of like North American um, usage. I mean, there's so the oldest one that I can find is like the Mazatec in Mexico, which is the Maria Sabina lineage, um, okay. you know, which is really how mushrooms made their way into the western awareness okay. um, and yeah so there's been some you know i've read some books there's a great book called consciousness medicine uh, by a woman named friends francois borzat i'm probably saying that wrong but um she trained with uh or trained in the mazatec tradition okay and um yeah that that 
approach is one of um, just like really holistic um, consideration of mind, body, spirit, community, environment, right. you know, really seeing that all parts of ourselves go into the go into the mix when you when you enter ceremony you, there's no picking and choosing like oh i'm going to look at this today or i want to focus on this thing it's just like you go in with your whole being um and you know not sure what's going to come forward or what's going to come out of it but um that's how you prepare is like you know a careful careful consideration of all aspects of your being um right right but yeah you know i've been really curious about uh, like Pacific Northwest, like first, first nation, um, traditions. And I haven't been able to find much. There's like one paper that's like really, you know, hidden away that, that also is very vague in terms of like describing traditions of, um, you know, Coast Salish or the people from this area that, cause the mushrooms grow here, you know, some of the right. world's most potent Cyanescent mushrooms grow in the Northwest. And I'm like, well, I know people have been eating these forever, but what are the traditions? And I, yeah. maybe it's just another example of just like, you know, lost wisdom. Yeah. Right. Whether it was recorded or not, I'm not sure. You know, we can only sort of guess, but um, right. Right. something I, I would love to learn more about if there is that, that knowledge and wisdom out there. Yeah. Yeah. Wonderful. Wonderful. So, <clears throat> So getting into maybe a little bit of the, I'm sure people are curious, you know, like what is, what is the experience like then let's say they're, they're, you know, in, in this modern time, you know, they're, they're curious about this. They, they want to give it a try. What is it, what does it look like? What does it feel like? What does, what can people expect from it? The... Well, the, uh, the process that I take people through, um, I guess over the years that I've been doing it has uh, has shifted a little bit to really focus on careful like preparation and uh, the mirror of that, you know, which is after the ceremony integration. Okay. Uh, when I started, it would just be like, Hey, what weekend are you free? Cool. I, <laughs> let's, let's meet up in the woods or wherever. And I'll give you some mushrooms. But I've realized that, uh, you know, while that approach can totally work for some and some people are just kind of ready, they already live a lifestyle where they're constantly mindful of certain things. Um, and just kind of well prepared for a journey like that, most of the time, some preparation goes a long way. So the first step is to, you know, make contact with someone and um, just feel out whether it's the right fit for them. Right. You know, obviously there's certain contraindications um, or just, you know, it, it might not be the right timing for certain people. So we talk that out. And then once we're like, yeah, this feels good, we pick a ceremony date, giving ourselves at least like two weeks, you know, ideally okay. two months you know just to prepare okay uh, and we have like a a more in-depth like preparatory meeting after that so we schedule something um i send them a prep packet give them a chance to look it over which is kind of like i talked about in the consciousness medicine tradition of like going through all the different aspects of your life uh to just as a tool of self-awareness okay what are the areas that i need that you know need some more care and attention sure uh, sure feel strong and have tools to utilize. Um, so then we talk about that. We have a nice long prep meeting where we go through all that uh, and just, you know, discuss their intention, what they'd really like to get out of the experience and peel back some of the layers there. Um, and then the ceremony itself is sort of an all day affair. People come in, usually we'll hold it either at the studio in our practice space or, um, you know, occasionally in people's homes, if that's easier for them, so they don't have to get rides to and from, uh, or even like out in a, you know, natural setting, you know, we have some retreat centers in the area that we can do overnight stays, uh, which are really nice if we can manage that. Cool. But the, yeah, the psychedelic journey itself is, you know, like you can, you've probably heard about like four to six hours of the, you know, real bona fide experience. And I give, uh, an, you know, an hour or two at the beginning to kind of, we do a little movement, some breathing, some meditation, mm -hmm. get people right. loosened up and warm, right. uh, receptive, calm, uh, before we take any medicine. Um, and then when the time comes, I serve up usually tea and uh, I don't take any myself. I'm just there as support um got it 
So people take medicine and it's either one-on-one -on -one or sometimes in a small group. And then it's kind of freestyling after that, you know, like mm -hmm. I really, I just try to give people space to do whatever they need to do. Um, one thing I do encourage at, at some point is for people to lay down and like put on the eye mask. So that's an interesting tool that has, um, you know, is used in pretty much all the research that's being done now. Um, you know, to make it really a therapeutic experience, because otherwise you can just be looking around at all the like cool things in the room and how right. everything's shifting and changing and have a very external focus. So yeah. Yeah. encouraging the, you know, the use of the eye mask and sometimes like headphones or there's gentle music playing um, to really facilitate that like inward journey um, is is something that some some people need a little suggestion they're like oh but it's so cool out here and just <laughs> lay down and you know you're right. we're doing this for you know uh for healing not just for fun right. although it, it is very um fun and entertaining at times yeah so yeah it it takes yeah four to six hours like i said and and there's often some bumpy uh or some bumps in the road early on as people as the medicine takes effect Okay. That's usually the most difficult stretch for people, you know, right. as, the, as your, as your normal sense of reality starts to melt and uh, fall mm. apart, right. uh, that can be really disconcerting. So, you know, mm. you kind of lose your sense of control right. and depending on how much you take, a lot of times, if it's someone's first time, we'll just go with a light dose and they can maintain a little grasp on their sense of reality and control over their perceptions. Um, but I really think the deepest healing comes when, People are able to really just let that go, surrender to the medicine. Right. And that doesn't necessarily mean a larger dose. Often correlates with the larger dose, but some people are ready to let it go sure. easier than sure. others. And um, yeah, that's when you can really just kind of be guided by the medicine into different memories or different realms, different parts of the universe, um, you know, different parts of yourself. And, yeah, absolutely. Absolutely. Yeah. So it sounds a lot different from um, my typical experience, you know, back in the day in the, you know, early nineties, um, you know, being at a, like a keg party and, um, you know, someone said, Hey, you want to do some mushrooms? And I was like, yeah, let's do it. <laughs> <laughs> and yeah. then just, woo, you know, off into the night. Right. So uh, yeah. uh, sounds very uh, intentional. Like there's a, there's a plan, there's some, you know, yeah, some introspection before the experience. There's, uh, you know, deliberate kind of setting this, this environment that's going to be conducive. And then you being there too, as a, as a guide to kind of keep people on course, right? To keep people on this, you know, certainly let people be themselves and to have their experience, but also to be there to be like, okay, now remember why we're here. Remember you know, what, what it is that you're doing here. So why don't you take a little time to, to, to go inward a little bit. So, um, yeah, so quite different, quite different from, the, from those, those, you know, parts. it's what's funny about that too, though, is like, um, if it weren't for those kind of like, you know, just for shits and giggles experiences that people usually sure. come in with, they're like, well, you know, I had, I took mushrooms in college and sure. Um, the mushrooms aren't really that picky. They'll be like, all right, you know, you want to take us at a party? Let's go. Let's, let's do this. We'll, we'll still show you, you know, we'll show you some things. And yeah. if it weren't for those experiences, a lot of people wouldn't even be, you know, uh, cued into it for later on in their lives. So it, it's, right. it's interesting. Like that, that does play a role that this sort of like people not really knowing what they're getting into, you know, mm -hmm. high school, college, and just sure. taking them sure. at parties. Sure. You could argue is not ideal for like healing purposes yeah. but it really uh it, it turns some people on to it turns a lot right. of people onto it and then right. later on they're like oh shit actually that I, I could that could be really profound and they get a sense of like the yeah. potential there right so right. Exactly. that brings a lot of people in <laughs> yeah for sure and you know i i you know i adjust a little bit because i had my certain experiences too of, of just deep introspection even if it was even if it was unpleasant right looking at maybe something in myself that i didn't want to see or was scared of or you know things like that um i always i you know when i was doing it in in those contexts i always had moments of that at least you know if not hours of that of of like wow this is really and this is important this is opening something up or mm -hmm. or this is showing me something within myself that really needs attention you know so um 
yeah yeah so uh but but i would have benefited i think i would have really benefited from just yeah somebody being there just kind of guiding the experience with a little more intentionality and and those times where it's like i was seeing things within myself or within the world that was scary or terrifying that a person there or a guide there to be able to be like okay so how do you how do you feel about that and you know let's let's see if we can move through that and 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 have an experience of coming out of that experience with something more than just fear more than just mm. uh, anxiety or more than just like oh fuck <laughs> you know so um but you know it's it's interesting what, as you were saying that um because we have kind of a similar phenomena in the hypnosis world which is we, you know lots of people have experience with hypnosis stage shows right whether it's in high mm. school or um at the county fair just these these yeah. more entertainment driven experiences that um, that some hypnotists hypnotherapists kind of look down on a little bit right they're like yeah, well, that's is. not really that's not what I do I don't do that I want to make make sure you understand I'm not one of those hypnotists right yeah. <laughs> but I have a tremendous amount of gratitude to all of them because they're exposing people to this phenomena mm -hmm. uh, in a way that's it, that that makes it very easy to understand um, even though there can still be some misconceptions about it as people come out of those experiences and they think oh but the hypnotist was doing something to people or things like that but at least people are, are comfortable with the idea they're like oh yeah i saw this i saw this show and yeah people were doing really interesting funny things and so i that's from that point on i, I thought maybe there's something to this maybe there's something mm -hmm. you know uh it, it's not just all an act so yeah. so that kind of introductory um aspect to it i think is very similar right yeah i hadn't thought of that uh, yeah, yeah. <laughs> so and that's one yeah, of the things, part. <laughs> right, exactly. So that's one of the things I'll ask, you know, my prospective clients in the preparatory process as well. It's like, what, so what's your experience with hypnosis? Even if it's just a hypnosis show or, you know, mm. seeing something on TV or you know, reading something about it. So, mm. right. yeah. 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 I think that's a, that, that's a nice segue into like, um, kind of the ideal clients or the or maybe just patterns that you see in the clients that you work with like who you know um who seeks out hypnosis or who is it most helpful for and likewise yeah. for for psychedelics because there's been some interesting uh and definitely noticeable themes in the people yeah. that i've worked with yeah yeah actually um I'm, I'm, i am really curious about that um so from my experience so far <laughs> And I've been doing this about as long as you have, so a little over four years. Um, and I don't know if it's just me personally, or, but I have I have heard other hypnotists and hypnotherapists express similar experiences. A lot of what we're working with is trauma, uh, mm -hmm. early trauma. That's that's kind of at the root of it, right? This early trauma that shaped one's self um, identity uh, in a negative way, in a distorted way. And that distortion of identity expressed as, you know, low self-esteem or self-loathing or some sort of, you know, just really not, not feeling one's worthiness, right? Feeling that one is uh, somehow broken or there's something wrong with them. They're inherently bad, right? Is the, that's the, that's the, the root of whatever behavior they're coming to change, whatever they're wanting to change, whether it's anxiety or stress or smoking cigarettes or drinking or you know whatever the the, the superficial I you know quote, I put it in air quotes superficial problem is at the root of it is this sense of distorted identity like I'm not a good person therefore I don't deserve happiness I'm not a uh, I'm not okay in the world uh, because I experienced this trauma and carrying that sort of that post-traumatic stress into adult life um these behaviors become soothing. These behaviors become solutions or strategies for dealing with that that core wound. Mm -hmm. So, um, so that's the that I, I would say, just about everyone that I work with, even if they're coming in and they're just saying like, "Hey, I just want to quit smoking," there's some level of that going on. There's some level of like, what happened when you're forming your sense of identity, who you are in the world. Um, and in an ideal situation, if we're growing up in a healthy family and a healthy, relatively healthy society, 
people are going to have pretty high self-esteem because they're going to come through these experiences of feeling nurtured, feeling cared for. They're gonna, their basic needs are going to be met. They're going to be valued. They're going to know that they have something to contribute into the society, into the culture. And so they're going to come out of that feeling really you know, quite strong about themselves. But when we don't have those things, when we have you know, broken homes and addiction issues in the home or violence or you know, or just simply, you know, unskillful parents, you know, who themselves weren't quite adult enough to be able to do it, um, to be mindful of the needs of the child and to fulfill that role, you're going to have this sort of this little schism, you know, uh, where people are like, they, they kind of, they, they move into adulthood with this wounded child part that is still needing their basic needs to be met as a child because they weren't met way back when. Mm-hmm. So that's the that's a, a common thread that I that I experience. Hmm. Yeah, that's interesting. Um, yeah, I mean, I think you probably described what's at the root of like you know anyone seeking healing, anyone on their healing path, uh, whether they know it or not. You know how deep c- certain things go, um, just based on the surface issues, like you said. Right. Um, yeah, something that one like common thread I've noticed for most of my clients uh, is being in a time of transition. Like uh, it's okay. interesting how people felt or just feel called to work with mushrooms, you know, and it's and it must work on a lot of subconscious levels. It's, um, you know, I, it's, it's hard to explain like why someone at just that point in their life is like, this is when I need mushrooms Mm -hmm. uh, or this is, I think mushrooms could help me here. And they often can't even explain like why exactly. They're just like, I just, it's, they're, they're calling to me or that, you know, I've been reading about it for a while and now it just seems like something's more urgent. Um, but yeah, often people are in a, some sort of transition in life, whether it's, you know, somebody passed away or they're wanting a change in their job or their living situation or their, you know, relationship. Um, and it's, it's interesting because mushrooms like in nature, they, they are sort of the stewards of the, really the sort of, death and rebirth part of the cycle like the end mm-hmm. you know as organic matter dies right um that's when fungus takes over and breaks down all that material and turns it back into like organic life-giving matter right so uh yeah they just they're at that sort of in between phase yeah uh, that allows for new growth new life to take place you know like this this planet would just be a giant heap of garbage if there was no fungus uh-huh. on the planet yeah. right um so it's interesting that like that serves a similar role for people where they're like being burdened by you know the detritus of various traumas and and like maladaptive conditioning and and beliefs and stories about themselves so uh when they're when something in them is telling them like hey it's time for us to like move on from some of this. It's time for us to let let certain things go and find our way. We're at like a some kind of fork in the road and our compass feels a little bit broken or it's foggy. And that's where I, what you were saying um, really resonates is like, it always seems to come back to like people's relationship with themselves mm-hmm. and, right. and a, a, a disconnection with themselves. Yeah. And it, you know, and that basic disconnection of uh, not really like knowing and feeling who you are, your inherent value and goodness. Yeah. You know, once you become disconnected from that, it's like, you know, you can end up in any number of, uh, you know, tough situations. Um, And it can be like a long, hard uh, battle to get back to really I mean you can get glimpses of really who you are but being able to like come back to like living from that place is like you know that's a something I think all of us are working on or those yeah, absolutely you know, spiritual journey it's like you absolutely. realize that it's like a whole lifetime of work yeah um the so I, my background uh 
and we've talked about it before, but it's with you know the Eastern spiritual traditions of um, you know rooted in the Vedas and these sort of these long <laughs> yogic traditions of introspection and you know kind of this path to awakening, enlightenment, those sorts of things, like liberation, real true liberation. And um, all of them say exactly what you're saying, which is that's what we're trying to get back to. We're trying to recognize the, the fundamental goodness of our being that's always there. It's always been there. Mm -hmm. It's never been gone. It's never, it's never been tainted in any way. It's never been, you know, it's not something lost, something that's there every single moment. And we've, it's just been covered over by, you know, delusion, um, misperception, um, you know, associations with not being that, being something other than that basic goodness and, and, uh, and, and basic purity. And um, yeah, it's just, it's, it's very, it's just very interesting that we're, we're no matter what we're talking about or how we're trying, how we're trying to get there, that's where we're all headed. Right. Yeah. That is essentially where we're all headed. And everyone is trying to do it according to their own best wisdom at the time. And for some people that's, you know, banging heroin or smoking fentanyl, um, you know, they're, they're just, they're trying their best. Right. Yeah. It's just that the way the method, the, the way that they're doing it, it's just not right. It's just not going to work. Right. It's never going to get them that because, um, it's, 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 uh, coming from a place of, of just too much woundedness, right. Too much disconnection. So, mm -hmm. so it's sort of this overcompensation, but, um, yeah. What are your thoughts on that? Yeah. I mean, it's interesting. Like I, you know, I think we both or both you and I, um, believe in some form of reincarnation and i think it's it's interesting to you know um like the the last part about like yeah smoking fentanyl or you know certain behaviors that people will take on and i do believe it's ultimately it's motivated by trying to regain some lost sense or like of of comfort of mm -hmm. acceptance of just like peace or like yeah. you know, um and yeah, I don't, I think like usually in, in, in this lifetime, that's, that's not going to help anyone out. Mm -hmm. um, but then it's also hard to, it's hard to judge like, okay, when, if you're looking at their soul's journey over many lifetimes, yeah, it's an important piece of the journey to uh, like ex have those experiences, you know, mm -hmm. like whether it's mm -hmm. just for contrast or whether, you know, like there's, there's so much to be learned in those experiences as well. That Absolutely. can be instrumental for someone's growth, you know, like, yeah. like you, yeah. you take that out of that soul's experience and, and they actually, you know, like that's, it, it's taking something away from them in terms of just what their soul is gaining and, and learning and um, ultimately uh, progressing from, you know, right. like right. being able to alchemize that into growth and progress. I mean, you know, yeah. taking your own life as a, as an example, is what we've talked about. Yeah, absolutely. And yeah, I, I'm very open about that, about my my journey of, uh, you know, addiction um, into, into re what we call recovery, you know. Um, and I think that's ultimately the trajectory of it, you know. Um, and it is, it's sort of like there's, it's a necessary, um, I don't want to even say evil. It's just an, a necessary part of one's development, right? Um, in the parlance of recovery, we talk about being grateful alcoholics, grateful addicts. And the mm -hmm. reason for that is, is because we wouldn't be the people we are. We wouldn't have this opportunity to, um, to embrace this new path of, of sort of hopefulness and introspection and authenticity, um, like really getting to know ourselves and really cultivating a sense of humility and awe. Uh, mm -hmm. While at the same time, like kind of really stepping into one's own purpose in life, which may not be some grand thing, but just simply on a level of like, hey, how do I how do I be a decent human being in this world? You know, um, how do I just, uh, you know, 
connect more and more with that inner goodness? How do I connect more and more with that, that true, true self and, and then share that in whatever way? So yeah, I, I totally agree. And, and when I see people on the street and they're doing that, my heart just goes out to them because I know, I know how, how brutal that life is. I know how, um, how painful it is and how, you know, ultimately, you know, they're going to get to a point, whether it's in this life or the next, where they're going to have to work through that, right? They're mm -hmm. going to have to come to a place of like, you know what? Yeah, this is causing me way more pain. And people around me, you know, their loved ones too are, are, are suffering as a result of that, which is, of course, it's all karma, right? We're all yeah. interconnected with this vast, inconceivable um, tendril, it's called in Tibetan, these, these interdependent connectedness and connectivity. Yeah. So we all have these soul contracts that we're fulfilling with each other as well. So, yeah. I mean, it's it's interesting. And I don't think any like coincidence that in this time of like, mass awakening that i believe we are in where there's mm -hmm. like uh, so much more like light pouring in you know uh, to use a simple analogy like there's also so much darkness or so much shadow being mm -hmm. cast like mm -hmm. while some of the population is like finally finding a way to like heal a lot of like their like deep right. deep wounding yeah we look outside and you know in most of the cities in this country there's like insane drug use and crime and just mm -hmm. you know people overdosing every day and like yeah. worse than it has ever been yeah right just to compare those two realities there's like yeah. concurrent realities right now and i really do think it's not a, it's not a coincidence it's like those two in some weird way go together like yeah. and yeah. i think that probably if we could look back at previous awakenings experienced by like large collectives that there is simultaneous existence of light and dark and you know as one expands the other one expands too right and, right. i mean it's weird that like right. that's like why why is it that way i don't know yeah. um yeah. but like yeah again it's kind of like well you can't you can't devalue that the darkness. I mean, it's sad and it is like so much right. suffering. Oh, right. It's like somehow it's playing into it's us also allowing for this awakening to put to take place. They're both yeah. allowing each other to happen in some way that I don't understand. Yeah, so. right. Exactly. Exactly. It's uh it's a it's a big, it's a big view. It's a big view of and there's there is, there's this, you know. Uh, all wisdom traditions just talk about you know that capacity i guess to to just hold both to hold mm -hmm. both without fear without judgment without um valuing one over the other or saying like this is good and this is bad this is light and this is dark i mean it's just all one it's all one it's all whole and complete um and that's a hard thing to reconcile from our dualistic point of view, right? Mm -hmm. Because we want to say like, no, that's bad. I, I, we shouldn't have that, right? Mm -hmm. That's, you know, that, that's just that's war. It's awful. Shouldn't have it, right? Famine on a mass scale. It's just, it's just a horror. It's, you know, no, I don't want that, right? And then, but what happens is when we start doing that externally, we're also doing it internally mm -hmm. to ourselves, right? We're saying like, no, this part of me is bad. So I need to get rid of that part or mm -hmm. change it or that's mm -hmm. not me really that's not the true me right mm -hmm. so when when we do that we you know we can spiral into more, just more confusion so yeah and that that takes me back to what we we're talking about just a little bit ago of um you know that basic basic disconnection or or distortion of the self being at the root of so much of the work that we both mm -hmm. do mm -hmm. and it just uh it just came to mind like there's um some very common beliefs around or are, are like i guess like obstacles like as people are looking to reconnect with that sense of self or 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 get a you know clear and undistorted view of their own goodness there's a lot of a lot of consistent beliefs about um our relationship to that true self and for me personally, the belief was like, I have to earn it. Mm -hmm. Right. Um, right. And another one that came to me as you were talking was a client I worked with who was essentially like, a, like had a lot of trust issues and was afraid of other people because she thought that 
other people can take it away from me. Mm-hmm. Right. Right. So that's another thing we we end up believing is like this thing that has actually always been ours and has never never been separated from us has always been within us um and is our birthright it's our inherent Mm -hmm. nature it cannot be taken it does not have to be earned um you know but there's a lot of we we place these these obstacles or these beliefs between us and that um that core of our nature uh and just that can run our whole lives Yes, you know? absolutely. Absolutely. Um, so yeah. it's interesting to think of just, and now I'm just curious, like what are some of the most common beliefs that people have of like, like, uh, yeah, it's, it's like, oh, it's not um, like, I have to, I have to like work, you know, I guess it's the same thing as kind of earning it. You yeah. Know? Right. Like you, it, it takes yeah. suffering in order to get it. Right. So it can't, if I'm like doing what I enjoy, it's not, it's like, that's a waste of time or something, you know? Yeah, um, that could actually be leading you back to yourself. Right, right. But yeah, right. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Totally. Um, I can see another. I can see a completely another episode coming here. Mm-hmm. <laughs> so, uh, probably several. Just as we've been we've been talking here just so far. Um, but one of the things that we talked about, maybe exploring a little bit, um, is how do we integrate these these experiences right going through some sort of process of self inquiry whether it's through mushrooms or other substances or hypnosis or whatever it is that one chooses right therapy you know meditation whatever whatever the the, the modality is isn't really that important but how do we integrate that and I guess, you know, breaking it down specifically, how do, how do you help people integrate their experience into something that they can carry with them? Mm-hmm. And I continue to build upon and continue to generate. Um, yeah. Yeah. More healing, new healing. Uh, so the way I understand and approach integration right now, um, I think there's two factors that are the most important um the first is simply giving time and space Mm -hmm. creating extra time and space in your day to integrate an experience so typically coming out of a you know a mushroom journey in the days weeks months following um people will have like flashbacks basically of like Mm -hmm. whoa i'm okay i'm being brought back to this part of my journey or like i'm just it's just in my mind um, you know, this specific person who was really with me during the journey or this, you know, whatever the lesson or the message was or the experience or the vision, it sticks with people and it, and it, it naturally arises in their mind, in their awareness. Right. So that's not something they have to try to do or not do that. They will be presented with the, with the memories, uh, or with the sort of like flashbacks. And then it's just about giving a little more time and space you know, um, right. and just having that intention, you know, cause it's, it's easy to just be like, Oh yeah, that was, that was pretty wild. And then, all right, anyway, what am I shopping for here? You know, it's right, like right. going right. right back into, um, your normal mode of thinking and not, not taking the bait, you know? So it's like, yeah. take the bait, like stop in the middle of the grocery aisle and just take a moment to be like, wow. Yeah. Like that, that, that thing that, that, my mom said to me like way back when which which is suddenly just coming back to me right now is um you know that that was part of my journey like let me just why is that coming up right now what, like what is the message in this moment for me like cuz maybe it's not exactly the message it was during your journey um and that's part of integration is just like being able to anchor these messages these visions these insights like continuing to just anchor them in your present lived experience Right. And that takes effort. That takes intention. It doesn't just happen. They don't right. anchor themselves. Right. Like you have to do that. Right. Um, so that's the first thing. It's just really encouraging people to like slow down. Mm-hmm. You know, right. it's a lot easier to do that if you're not just moving at your, you know, so many of our normal paces of living. Yeah. Um, so taking taking a slower pace at least for a few days, if possible. I mean, for as long as possible. That's what I'm focusing on now. Is like, how do I just slow down in general? Yeah. 
Um, and then the second part is uh, just more of like a helpful model, which is um, really I see like having a psychedelic journey is kind of, you know, you're, you're sort of blasting off into these more um, ethereal realms, you know, you're kind of, you, you know, as many people report, like leaving your body, leaving your normal sense of perception, and you enter into some realm, some state of consciousness that is often more abstract, often like sort of your, you know, your senses are mixed together. It's like, it's harder to grasp. It's more of just this felt experience um and you're sort of like gathering you're just like out in the universe kind of like with like a some sort of net just kind of flying around scooping stuff up and and you you catch certain things right like right. certain things that were meant for you end up in your net and then as you start to come back down into your body you've got this net full of all kinds of weird sparkly treasures you've gathered up um, and they're, and they're sort of still morphing and changing. And you're like, what is, what is this thing? I, I don't know what it means yet. Um, but you're taking things from a sort of more, you know, ethereal realm or sort of cosmic place. And this also, you know, this is internal space. Like I believe sure. we've got deep space inside. Yeah. So this, this is like internal space, external space, sort of mirroring each other. You're doing a deep dive into yourself and coming up with stuff that you're like, huh, interesting. I didn't know that was in there. Um, so coming directly out of an experience, you've got all these kind of more nebulous experiences or threads, right? So you've got these various threads or ideas and then slowly, you know, without rushing it or forcing it too much, allowing those threads to start like twining together um, into a little bit more understandable concepts or ideas, things that you can maybe put words to. Right. Um, right. And, and that's, or, or movements to, or sound to, you know, it's like, however, uh, however you want to express it, some of the ideas or downloads or whatever you want to call them from a psychedelic experience, they beg to be given form in some way or expressed in some way. So yeah. Um, it's sort of like that's sort of the first stage is like okay how do you um how do you work with them you know like whether that's if you're if you're a movement person if you're a music person if you're a, a writing person like do that you know create express and allow some of these things to take form right. uh, and then so i really see it as a process of coming from like way up here then down into sort of the more like slightly more dense conceptual realm Right. And then eventually being anchored in the body right. and through action, through, you know, specific and intentional speech, um, you know, so it's really like a funneling down yeah. from this like, like large abstract cosmic energy to like slightly um, more verbalized or expressible concepts and ideas. And then down eventually into like very real and concrete, physical practices physical habits yeah, right and that's right. kind of the final stamp of like okay once it's become part of your daily routine or your morning or evening ritual or yeah. really like um one of the foundational like beliefs that you that you hold about the world or hold about yourself and then that can be seen in your actions um so that's kind of how i see integration is the general like weaving you're getting all these beautiful like cords and threads that come down and some of them are meant for you and you start to weave those together and eventually boom you're like wearing the shirt and you're like sweet all right this is just part of my wardrobe now right and right. Uh, and you can then then it's just natural so uh, yeah integration is done when you're like not having those flashbacks as much anymore and you're just wearing the shirt and it's just feels natural yeah uh, yeah so yeah cool cool wonderful um yeah as you as you're kind of going through all of that, I was, I was just kind of saying, well, how do I do things? And everything that you were saying, like resonates on some level. It's like, almost like there's these, you know, very direct connections to the process. Right. Because again, I mean, I think that basically we're doing the same work with people and on ourselves as well. Um, and there's just simple, simply there's, there's just ways that just work to, mm -hmm. to integrate these things into our life. Um, so when I, you know, start um, working with people, no matter what they are presenting, right, as the issue, I know that the ultimate 
aim is really to just connect them to their true self and everything else is going to be fine right that's the that's the problem yeah the disconnection from the true self so i don't even you know it's like as i'm sitting here i have got lots of compassion and i've got a lot of you know i want to you know help people work through whatever issue they're 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 wanting to work through but i know that that's not the fundamental issue that's not the fundamental problem that they come to see me for so you know connecting one you know connecting to our true self can be this really mind-blowing experience of recognizing that oh my gosh i'm so much bigger than i thought mm -hmm. i am i'm yes. connected to everything around me i'm eternal i'm without beginning or end i'm i'm just the source of all being flows through me and through all beings. I'm connected, right? And there's mm -hmm. tremendous wisdom, tremendous love, tremendous uh, compassion that flows through that experience. And it's always there, always accessible. It's just that we're, you know, temporarily blocking it somehow. So again, the 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 the, the thing is though, like after one has that sort of that peak experience or that um that moment of like, wow, you know, it feels like enlightenment, right? But then yeah. what happens next? Then you do, you've got to walk out the door and you've got to get in your car and you've got to take care of the kids and you've got to go back to work and all these things. So I just help people, you know, through a process of first, first of all, trusting that your higher self and your subconscious mind are going to integrate these things naturally. So again, that's the time and space component. Just, you know, give it time, let it be, trust in yourself and trust in your ability to integrate this. Um, and then there's, you know, things that we can suggest while in hypnosis that as you move through your life, you know, each time that you feel your foot on the ground connecting with the earth, some part of you is going to remember this experience. Some part of you is going to remember that you are whole and complete as you are that your nature is fundamentally good, that you are greater than the sum of your parts. So making it a very visceral experience, a very you know concrete somatic experience so that moment by moment, breath by breath, we're able to sort of like just become more and more aligned with that, that true self energy, that true self pure being. And then, yeah, then it becomes like, so then how does one do it with intentionality? You know, we have to intentionally sit down and have some sort of a practice or some sort of a ritual or some sort of a routine where we're actively connecting to that energy, connecting to that true self, connecting that inner wisdom. So whether that's through meditation or hypnotic processes or techniques or, you know, just whatever, whatever works, right? And, and right, like you say, it could be music, it could be dance, it could be art, it could be writing, whatever it is. Still, there needs to be this intention of like, I'm going to now, oh yeah, that's right. I'm getting caught up in the ego. I'm getting caught up in, you know, the the delusion, the fantasy, uh, the, uh, the, the delusion of separateness. I want to come back intentionally and reconnect with that. So you know, more and more just being able to do that on a regular basis in one's life and make that the central, mm -hmm. almost experience, you know, purpose of one's life is to recognize our true self, right? So, so just kind of doing that more and more and finding it easier and easier to do and just relying on one's own capacities for healing and learning and growth to just continue into the future. Mm -hmm. And it might be that both of the experiences that people have, whether they come to you for you know, a psilocybin experience, or they come to me for hypnosis, those are just stepping stones of preparing them for the next thing, right? Mm -hmm. Preparing for them for the next journey, for the next thing. Maybe they're going to, you know, go off and do, you know, some other, I don't know, breathing breath work workshop, or, you know, whatever they do, it, it doesn't really matter. But it's just you know, kind of this, this attitude of continued self inquiry, continued growth, continued healing, you know? Mm -hmm. Yeah. yeah. Amen. <laughs> <laughs> right. So, well, I hope you enjoyed our conversation on psilocybin and hypnosis, how these two uh, modalities, you know, psychedelic therapy and hypnotherapy uh, intersect, complement each other, and sometimes, uh, you know, just diverge because they're two different things, uh, even though they're aimed towards, you know, essentially the same goal. And if you have any questions about anything that we talked about here in this episode, or if you want to connect with me or Owen, uh, you can reach out and you can connect me through my website, which is truenaturehypnotherapy.com. You can email me at chris at truenaturehypnotherapy.com, or you can call me at 206-747-1095. 
If you want to reach out to Owen and connect with him, you can do so through the Heart Center for Awakening website, and that is the heartcenterforawakening.com. So again, I hope you enjoyed this uh, episode, um, this interview, and this conversation. I'm looking forward to doing more of these in the future where we just take a deep dive into the human mind, the human experience, and the human journey.